at long last, Josh Yoey of The Athletic is here to talk all things related to the Pittsburgh Penguins, including his thoughts on the first half of the season as a whole, some trade talk, so much of that, plus a lot more coming up for today's episode of the Locked On Penguins podcast. Your Locked On Penguins, your daily podcast on the Pittsburgh Penguins, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Locked On Penguins podcast. I'm your host, Hunter Hodes. Remember to follow me on Twitter at Hunter Hodes, follow the show's Twitter at LOR Penguins. And of course, thank you all so much for making this your first listen of the day. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. You can visit fanduel.com slash locked on today to get started. As uh, in, in, well, as teased, I should say, in my intro, uh, Josh Yelly from The Athletic is here to talk all things related to the Pittsburgh Penguins. It's great to have you back on the show. And you know, I think we'll be doing a lot more of this in the future, but I'm not allowed to talk about that just yet. Um, <laughs> but Josh, you know, let's just get right into it here. Uh, first half of the season is, well, this this is the unofficial halfway point. The official halfway point was about, I think, a week or two ago. Uh, Penguins find themselves in the final playoff spot right now. If the playoffs start right now, they will be on a runaway train to go play the Boston Bruins in the first round. The Buffalo Sabres are one point behind them. What do you make of the first season, the first half of the season as a whole? Well, hello, Hunter. Thank you for having me back on the, the finest podcast of them all. Um, I, I don't know. Mike Sullivan likes to use the word uh, volatility. There's a lot of volatility in our game. I have the worst Boston accent ever, so I, I won't do that again for your <laughs> listeners. Um, I, I would agree with him. I, I think in general it's been a disappointing season. Maybe not quite the disastrous one that we make it out to be at times, but the fact is when you, you bring everyone back and when you sign Raquel and you sign Russ to go along with Latang and Malkin, the expectations were to have a championship caliber team, and they don't look like one right now. Uh, they are a team with a lot of flaws. They are a team that, you know, frankly, if, if they failed to make the playoffs, I don't think any of us would be shocked. Maybe a little surprised. I don't think shocked at this point. Um, they have obvious flaws, and they are maddening to watch. Um, I actually wrote about this the other day, Hunter. Um, a lot of people will say, well, they're too old. Of, of course they can't win a championship. Why would you think they're a championship team? And I will counter that by saying the old guys don't really look old. Uh, this is a team that loses games because of the – mistakes that it makes and they are mistakes that a youthful team would normally make how many games have they lost this season because of a bad line change or because of just failing to recognize simple defensive zone coverages uh stuff like that it, you wouldn't expect an old team to do that kind of stuff so it's not an easy team to figure out i'm fascinated to see how the next couple of months unfold um but i i can't say that it's been a good start <laughs> No, it definitely has it. And, you know, you, you make a great point with, you know, the defensive zone lapses and the line changes. You know, I, I throw goaltending in there a little bit as well, just because I don't mm. think Casey DeSmith has been that good no. um, th this season either. And, you know, that the decision to run back that tandem through the, for the third year in a row, definitely, you know, it was a risk at going into the second year. And then they doubled down on it going into this year. And, you know, I think they're slowly starting to, to pay the price a little bit right now. Um, I was going to ask you about, you know, th this is the elephant in the room, Josh, the bottom six. Um, mm -hmm. Just, it's just a tire fire, I think, to be honest. And at the fourth line, it looks like they have something cooking at times. I like what Drew O'Connor is bringing on a nightly basis right now. Uh, Ryan Paling has come back and his numbers have actually not been too bad. I would oh. say Josh Archibald, I think is going to help that as well. He at least scores on that line, but the third line is the bread and butter for how they can be a cup contender. We've seen it in 2009, 2016, and 2017, and even before then when, you know, they had some really good teams and some of their third lines were not bad. Heck, I look at the 2012 team as a team that could have won it all, but that got screwed up or over by goaltending. Um, just how much of a failure do you think it is from Ron Hextall with, you know, constructing this third line going into this season? Because this team used to have one of the best third lines in hockey and probably one of the best bottom sixes as a whole right before Jim Rutherford resigned and in the two years since, 
he has just completely disbanded it and has probably made it one of the worst bottom sixes in the league, at least third line wise. Yeah, they have enough players to have a perfectly competent fourth line. Like you mentioned, Ryan Paling, I kind of like him actually. I, I think <laughs> I think there's something there. If we remove, you know, the fact that he was a first round pick, sometimes you have to get that out of your head because players will feel like disappointments. Well, he's a first round pick; he should be a you know a certain kind of player. Well, pretend Ryan Paling was a fourth round pick, and you might say, you know what, he's not bad. Uh, he can do some things. Archibald in the first couple of months before he was hurt was a pleasant surprise, I think. And I still like Drew O'Connor. I, I, I think there's something there. So, yeah, they, they have the bodies to put together a, a fourth line that can play you eight to ten minutes a night and do some good things. The third line, however, um, I, I don't even think they really have one. I mean, I mean, it's to the point where the third line the last few games uh, was just Mike Sullivan taking the guys who were playing like crap and putting them together so that they couldn't affect the other three lines. So that's basically – what it's coming down to, we can start with Jeff Carter. Listen, we know the contract is a bad one, and I think anybody who watches him play can very clearly see that he just got old in a hurry. And usually when that happens, that's irreversible. I, I, I don't know that the hands are coming back or that the legs are coming back, and that's a huge problem. And and you know who I think is just as big of a problem right now? It's easy to blame Carter, and I get it. Teddy Bluger. You know, th this is a guy I've always liked, a good two-way player who was at least a really good fourth-line center, if not maybe a guy who could potentially be a third-line center. Teddy Bluger broke his jaw about a year ago. <laughs> Since then, including the playoffs, he has one goal in 66 games. Um, I, I don't know if it's injury-related. If, if you know that The broken jaw, is a, that's a nasty injury. A lot of guys have trouble coming back from that. I don't know if it was that. I don't know if it was Zach Astor and East being traded. Those two are really good together for a long time. Brandon Tanev, too. Yeah, you're right. Um, whatever the case may be, Teddy Bluger's not the same player. Jeff Carter's not the same player. Brock McGinn has 10 goals. That's great. Does anybody really think that was sustainable? Do you really notice him otherwise contributing positive things? No, nah, he's just a guy. Um, Kasperi Kapanen, I actually think, has been a little better – uh, before the injuries in recent games, you certainly notice him with the speed. I do think he was going to the net more, but let's not act like he hasn't been a disaster because he has been. So those are your candidates for the third line or Danton Heinen, who scores a goal like once every two months. Um, and I, I don't know. Everyone wants to see Ron Hextall make a move. Hell, I want to see Ron Hextall make a move. Uh, it's a team that badly needs one, but I don't even know if one move uh, could alter this bottom six to the – to the place where you would at least say that it wasn't a, an abject failure. It, it's just a gigantic problem. And and the burden that it puts on Crosby and Malkin to be great every single night at their ages, it's a lot to ask. Yeah, I mean, I, I said in my, my Tuesday episode, Josh, it's very similar to the teams that were built. I felt like in 2013-14, 2014-15, the end of the Ray Shiro days, where it was all on the top six to score. You had guys in the fourth line like – Zach Sill, Joe huh. Vitale, Marcel Gotch, Marcel Gotch, yeah, Maxime Lapierre. Oh God, yeah, he. I mean, at least he was a funny dude to watch, but he couldn't right. to save his life. Um, you know, Brian Gibbons, who you know, I, okay, a little not bad at times. I know people loved. Here's an OG name, Bobby Farnham. People loved that guy. Huh. Um, you know, but th those were the kind of guys that were in your, in your bottom six there. Brandon Sutter, I'll even throw in there. I don't really think he scored that often, but he was fine for what he was. Well, well and the point is, Hunter, these are all guys who don't have Stanley Cup rings. No. Uh, not, never even sniffed one, in fact. So, that, that's also true, yeah. Tough. And, you know, it, it put a lot of pressure on the, the core when they were a lot younger. And now when they're a lot older, but they can still produce, it still puts even more pressure on them. And, and I definitely agree with you, Josh. I don't understand why people – are so quick to blame the core. I, it's so weird. Like I, I understand the best players, they're going to get some of the scrutiny just because they're your best players. But I saw you in your article. Sidney Crosby's on pace for 100 points. Evgeny Malkin is at a point per game this season. Oh, is Vince Trocheck or Andrew Kopp at that point pace? No. Yeah. Chris Letang, he's been through hell and back this season, but I would still rather have him as my number one defenseman at $6 million per over anyone that signed this past offseason. So, 
you know, Ricard Raquel's been great. Brian Rust, you can argue, has not been that good. Jake Gensel's been up and down. But most of the core players have been awesome this year. It's just the outer edges of the lineup where I think Hextall has really screwed them these last couple of years. And he kind of has them in a spot where, you know, this is the first time in my, you know, I, I started watching this team a little bit before Crosby came. I was a little kid at the time, but for as long as I can remember, this is probably the probably the most scared I've been in terms of this team making the playoffs. I, I can't even back in 2014, 15, when it came down to the final game, Josh, I think mm. I wasn't scared about them winning that game. They were playing yeah. had no one Sabres team. It was uh Brandon Sutter with both goals in that yeah, game. That's right. In Buffalo. In fact, um, that team was collapsing, no question. And that, of course, uh, if you're looking to, to be an optimist, the one good thing is that team was coached by Mike Johnston. And this team has Mike Sullivan. And you can certainly argue with some of the decisions Sullivan has made this season. I don't agree with everything he's done, but I still think he's a great coach. Um, but, yeah, you, there's no question, Hunter. Um, the Penguins, I would take it back to – Crosby's second season, which was Malkin's first season, the 6 07 campaign when they made the playoffs for the first time in the Crosby era. Um, going all the way back to that point, which is, you know, what, 15, 16 years now, uh, this is the most vulnerable the Penguins have felt to me. And it's it's not just one thing, right? You mentioned the bottom six. It's a disaster. Power plays awful. Um, Crosby and Malkin have been healthy. They've played in every game. Is that going to hold up? Like at their ages and the number of minutes they're playing, that's a concern. It absolutely is. Uh, is Tristan Jari going to stay healthy? If he is going to miss any more time, can Casey to Smith stop anything? Um, yeah, that that's a lot of questions. And the blue line has its question marks as well. So I, I, going back to what you were saying, though, I don't blame the core. Um, Crosby's still one of the best players in the league. He, he's still a dominant player. Malkin of the big three, I think you can see age showing up with him more than anyone else. But he's on pace for 84 points. I, I can't give him too hard of a time, and he's been really good lately. I think Malkin in the last two or three weeks has been outstanding. Um, Latang, he stunk in October and November. We all know it. Yeah. Um, he was dealing with health problems that are not common. And... You know, I, I don't know if he was having symptoms before the stroke. That's only between Chris and his doctors, and I, I hate to speculate, but I can tell you there are people in the organization who think, you know what, there was something going on with him. He was not himself, and I think he's been pretty good since he returned to the yeah. lineup since the stroke. I really do. I think he's playing more at the level we're accustomed to Chris Letang playing at, so I'm not going to blame those three. Raquel's been great. Zucker's been great. Rust hasn't been himself. Gensel hasn't been himself, but they're still good players. Like, they're not the problem. The problem is, you know, those six other uh, forwards, right? I mean, that's the problem. And, you know, you got two or three defensemen that you just don't know about. Um, that's tough because the Penguins are playing in the Metropolitan Division. And that division, I don't need to tell any of your uh, uh, other people watching or listening, that that division is a nightmare. It's the best division in hockey. The Eastern Conference is, is scary. There are 10 or 11 legitimately good teams in the East. Not everybody's going to get in. So, yeah, the Penguins are vulnerable, no question. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think all of this is to say that, you know, the general manager probably needs to do something sooner rather than later. Heck, Lou Morello just made a trade, and they're behind the Penguins right now. They're not waving the white flag at all. And, you know, we're going to touch on that coming up right after this commercial break. But before we get to that, this year the only app you need at your Super Bowl party is FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. We're really excited about our new sports betting partner for Locked On because there's they are the number one sports book in America. Of course, I forgot my wonderful little promo at the bottom of the screen for you those on YouTube. And if you are new to FanDuel, that's even better. They have so many great features that make betting on sports fun and easy. You can download FanDuel right now so you can go bet Super Bowl 57 with a no sweat first bet. You'll get up to $3,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet does not win. They let you bet on anything from the money line to point spreads to who will score a touchdown. You know, for this game personally, again, I keep saying it. I like the Eagles money line. I think they've been the best team in football all season. Patrick Mahomes will still be a bit banged up. Um, in terms of, I guess, any time touchdown score, give me Miles Sanders for the Eagles. He was electric against the 49ers. Um, and I think he's going to do really well against the Chiefs defense. Um, you can download FanDuel right now. Again, so you can bet Super Bowl 57 with a no sweat first bet. All in an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. And best of all, you can get paid your winnings 
instantly. So join FanDuel at FanDuel.com slash locked on to claim your no sweat first bet on Super Bowl 57. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sportsbook partner of the NFL and locked on. All right, we're back here on this episode of the Locked On Penguins podcast. I'm your host, Hunter Hodes. That is Josh Shelley to my right. So, Josh, the trade market kicked off in a big way this week. The Vancouver Canucks started their fire sale or their major surgery. As Jim Rutherford said, he's also not going to be talking about the team much anymore because he even said at his media conference that he spoke too much, which I think he's done throughout his career. Um, you know, they send Bo Horvat to the Islanders for Anthony Beauvillier, R2 Ratti, and then a first round pick. Josh, you know, have you heard any rumblings about the Penguins and potential trades? I, I read, I think, um, I think it was yesterday that Dave Molinari of Pittsburgh Hockey Now said that Brian Burke, um, he spoke to Brian Burke, who said that Hextall is working on, is trying to work on something. What What is the latest that you've heard with regards to the GM and trying to figure something out with the trade? Well, first of all, I'm glad Jim Rutherford likes to talk because it's made me a lot of money over the years. So keep talking away, Jim. I should just call Jim and say, hey, you don't want to talk about your Canucks? Fine. Let's talk about some other stuff, Jim, because you yeah. know, Jim likes to talk. Um well, first of all, that was a very interesting trade. Uh, I thought the Islanders gave up a lot for a rental. Um, I give them credit for being aggressive. I wonder if that will come back to haunt them. I don't know. I think Bo Horvat's a really good player. I don't know that he's a great player. Um, but they needed offense badly. So you're going to go with him and Barzell down the middle now. That's pretty good. Yep. Um, that, you know, that changes things for the Islanders, no question. Um, as for the Penguins, I don't think anything is imminent. Um, my guess is they will make a trade at some point before the deadline. I don't know that it will be of the blockbuster variety. I think anything's possible. Um, Ron Hextall's human. He knows what people are saying about him. You know, he knows people are making jokes about oh, is Ron awake or what's going on. Um, I suspect because of that pressure and because the Fenway Sports Group has made it pretty clear they wish to win. He's going to try to do something before the deadline. Uh, he does have problems, some of which are his own doing. Uh, half of his roster has a no trade clause. So it's it's not easy just to snap your fingers and whip up a trade if you're Hextall. Um, obviously, there's the cap to deal with as well. Uh, my sense is he will add a forward at some point before the deadline. I think they are aware of the glaring weakness they have in the bottom six. I do think they'll try to bring someone in. Hextall does not like to trade first-round picks. I would be surprised if he were to do that, especially in a draft as good as this one coming up. And I'm not just talking Connor Bedard. This whole draft from every scout I've talked to is apparently just loaded with talent. So yeah. they don't really want to trade that pick. Um, I think, Hunter, whatever the Penguins do in February is going to be very telling. They have a nasty schedule coming up. You start the second half with Colorado. Then you go to California, which I know two of those teams stink, but they gave the Penguins fits recently. Um, that's still not an easy trip. Then you go to Long Island. Then you play the Devils the next night at home. All right. Then you you got the Islanders again. Then you got to go to St. Louis and you get Tampa the next night at home. Then you got to go to Nashville and Tampa and Florida. It's a brutal stretch of schedule. If the Penguins flounder during this month, it, it wouldn't shock me if Ron Hextall says, you know what? I don't think it's worth giving up assets. We are not a cup team. But say Jari gets healthy. Say they rip through California and, and win a couple of big divisional games and have themselves firmly, you know, in a playoff spot three weeks from now. Or on next, I'll go make a move. Yeah, I, I suspect that he will. So um, it, I think he's feeling the pressure to do something. And I think that he will. Just how big of a move it will be, boy. I I know everybody wants to trade Dumoulin and Kapanen to uh, you know to some crap team for all their best players. That's not going to happen, but I, I think they will do something. Yeah, I mean they kind of have. I mean they kind of have to. Yes. The third line center spot I think is probably the biggest weakness on the roster right now it's just you know how many centers are truly available you know i i had my big board a little bit last night josh on a tuesday episode and i you know i i circled the st louis blues because that's a team right now that i think they're out of it the math oh, yeah. is not good for them i circled ryan o'reilly makes a lot of money mm. they would have to retain still can play 
like him. I circled Ivan Barbashev. I think he's a good player uh, that could play in the bottom six. Selling that I think makes a lot of sense for Brian Burke and Ron Hexall. I think he's the type of player that they would go after. Um, you know, if you want to talk more pipe dreams, you can look at Vladimir Tarasenko, but I don't think yeah. we're going to get him. He's probably, you know, well, I hear him. apparently Barbashev's available. That, okay. That's the word. And I can tell when he was with the Rangers a couple of years ago, I think that was the uh, COVID season when he had a really good year for them. Every time the Penguins played them, and it was like eight times that year, right? Because of the schedule. Mm. I thought he was their best player almost every game. I was like, who yeah. is this guy? Um, he's really talented. I don't think he really fits in. He's a skilled guy. I don't think he fits in with how the Blues play. The Blues are a little, you know, old-fashioned, if you will. They like their heavy hockey. Um, there's not very good right now, but he's a guy that would be interesting. Like, And, and you know, everyone's going to talk about the bottom six. There's a lot of ways you can look at it, though. If you can get a top six guy, a guy who has a real high skill level that maybe could play with a Malkin, for instance, there's nothing wrong with sliding Brian Russ down to the third line, for instance, no. or even Jason Zucker, whoever. I, I, I use Russ because, you know, he got paid. He's happy. His ego is not going to take a blow if you put him in the bottom six for a season. And Brian Rust, yeah, maybe he's not having a great year. Well, guess what? You put him on your third line, that makes your third line substantially better. So th there's different ways you could look at it. I just think they need a forward who can score. I mean, that's to me, that they're not going to go through the playoffs winning games 2 1. It's not how they're built. They're built to score goals, they're built to outscore people and to outskate people. They need more forwards. So any of those guys you mentioned, I mean, O'Reilly, gosh, I don't I don't know what they would have to give up to get him. And if he yeah. were available, other teams just have more prospects and more draft picks. So it makes it hard for the Penguins. But some of the other names out there, yeah. I mean, it, it would absolutely make sense. Yeah, you know, another one I you know some people have asked me, and it makes a little bit of sense. Um, but I don't know, I don't know. He makes a lot of money. Is you know, you look at Chicago. You know, would Jonathan Taves be interested in coming here? But also, how much does he have left in the tank? You know, I'm not really sure about that. But yeah. there was a trade rumor I saw yesterday, Josh. I want to get your thoughts on. Elliot Freeman went on the Jeff Merrick show. A great listen, by the way. And he touched on uh, Thatcher Demko from the Vancouver Canucks, and he listed. And then he wrote it in his blog, and he said, you know, the teams that make sense to him, uh, Buffalo, Los Angeles, and then he put Pittsburgh. Have you heard anything on them going out and getting another goalie as a potential um, deadline target? You know, I, I put James Reimer in there as a good 1B option, but, man, I just really can't see them going out and getting someone like Demko with the money he makes and how awkward that is with Tristan. I just think that would be weird. I do too. Yeah, I saw that report, and I, I like Elliot a lot, and I, you know, I respect Elliot. I, I don't know that Elliot – I don't know if he said he he heard that to be true or if he was just kind of theorizing that that would make sense. Um, the Penguins, sure, they could use a, another goaltender. I don't think there's any question. Um, I don't think they need another number one goaltender, which is what I think Demko is. I mean, yeah. He's a very gifted guy who's having a bad year and who was playing behind the worst blue line in hockey probably, which doesn't help goaltenders. Um, but just financially, it doesn't make sense to me. I don't see that happening. I think they could use a better backup than Casey DeSmith. Um, he's been a disappointment. There's no other way to, to put it. And I realize the Penguins leave him hanging out to dry a lot. I understand that. But – in this era of uh, analytics and advanced numbers, I have a very simple statistic for you, Hunter. When Tristan Jari starts games, the Penguins are 16, five and five. Um, he's, he's by far their best goaltender. Yeah. It's not close. The Smith hasn't been good enough. Uh, I would be in favor of the Penguins. If not now, then certainly this summer upgrading their backup goaltender situation, especially given how often Jari gets hurt. Uh, I don't know how plausible it is right now. You don't see goalies traded during the season very, very often for a reason. And um, I, I think if I were Ron Hextall, if I'm running the Penguins, yeah, I'd love to have a better goaltender, but that's probably something I worry about in the summer. If they have a chance to do anything this spring, they have to upgrade it forward, in my opinion. And you really just have to hope Tristan Jari stays healthy and gets hot. He, he's your best chance. You're not going to get a, another goaltender, I don't think, who can challenge him in that regard. Um, so I, I just – as frustrating as the lack of goaltending depth is for everyone, and I understand that, 
I, I just don't know if it's the number one priority right now. Yeah. And I understand that, you know, the bottom six, I think is, you know, a little you know more important at this point. Um, now I'm going to put your G- GM tinfoil hat on right now, Josh, you know, of the players that are available with about five weeks to go, and this is going to change. The prices are going to go down. You know, if you were on Hextall, who would you be looking to acquire for the bottom six? Who, who out there do you think makes a lot of sense for the Penguins? Well, you mentioned Taves, and I, I would probably stay away from him. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just – it's a lot of money, and I just don't know how good he is anymore, how much of a difference he would really make. I don't know that he will be traded at all. Um, I, I don't know, though. It's I don't know which – Number three centers will be available, or if any of them will be available. Um, but you're right. That's the priority. I think we have learned Jeff Carter is no longer a number three center. I think we have learned that Teddy Bluger is not a number three center. And I don't think there's any reason to think Ryan Palin or Drew O'Connor are ready for that role. They don't have anyone else who can really function there. That should be the goal, to get a number three center without giving up a first-round draft pick. If you can do that, go for it. I don't know that Taves is the guy. Um, You mentioned Barbashev. It's funny you bring him up. I I actually was thinking about him the other day. Man, I've always liked him. I, I, I just think he'd really fit in well with how the Penguins play. I think he needs to be with a team that kind of pushes offense more than, say, St. Louis does. Um, even to get a guy like that, even if you didn't have your number three center, if you could at least, you know, have some scoring threats in your bottom six, even if they weren't centers, I, I think that's probably mm-hmm. something that would make sense. Um, let's see what happens with the market. I'm very curious. I, I thought the Islanders gave up a lot to get Horvat, and I like Bo Horvat a lot. But the fact is, you know, he could leave New York in three months, and you gave up. You leave in five weeks if they uh, bought him out. Yeah, yeah right. You, you gave up a first round pick and a great draft year. You gave up a pretty good prospect and you gave up a pretty good player to get him. That's a lot. Um, so maybe that will dictate the way the market goes. That's not really a good thing for the Penguins if that's the case moving forward. They only have so much to give up. But a bottom six forward is, is, is very clear. And I, I hate just throwing names out there because. It's yeah. still really difficult to say who will be available and who will not. But I will say this. As opposed to, you know, the Penguins just giving up a draft pick or a prospect to try to bring in a player, um, is it the worst thing in the world to think about an actual hockey trade? And maybe they have to give up a player on their roster that they like, you yeah. know? Maybe they have to – and I'm not – I have not heard anything along these lines, so don't take it this way, but – I like Jan Ruda. He's a solid player. Do they really need Jan Ruda? Did they really need him last summer? Right? When you've got Latang and Peter on the right side, Ruedel's okay. Friedman's okay. Like, you're not – they weren't desperate for Jan Ruda. Maybe there are teams out there that would love to have a Jan Ruda who really want that, you know, number five defenseman, a sturdy right-handed guy who might be willing to give up a good third-line player for him. I just, I'm just throwing ideas out there. It might yeah. have to be something like that more than – the typical, we'll give you a couple prospects, give us a player. Yeah, no, I, I hear you on that. I mean, I mean, they barely have any cap space right now, Josh, and they don't even have enough space to keep Ty Smith up, who looked pretty good, I would say, um, when he made his Penguins debut <clears throat> earlier this season, and you know, I think is in their plans for next season. Once I would think Brian Dumoulin walks, I don't think he's going to be resigned. Right. Um, that wraps up this second segment. Coming up in the final segment, I'm going to get Josh's thoughts on what he's looking forward to seeing in the second half. Who needs to be better? And then also just, you know, what could happen if this team, you know, goes on the path that right now I think a lot of people um, are expecting. So that's all coming up right after this commercial break. But first, if you're looking for a delicious treat but don't want all the fat and calories, then you have to try a Built Bar. We just got through the holidays. I know my goal is to eat a little healthier this year. If you're like me where you want to eat healthier but don't want to compromise taste, then, man, I've got just the thing for you. You got to try Built Bar. With Built Bars, healthy is actually tasty. Seriously, they are very delicious and you won't think they're good for you. They're perfect for your New Year's resolution. What makes them so good? Well, for starters, they're all covered in real chocolate. That's right, 100% real chocolate. And they come in unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, and coconut almond. 
I'm not sure how Bill does it, but these bars taste like a candy bar while maintaining amazing macros. And what's even better is that they are healthy, only 130 calories and four grams of sugar with a whopping 17 grams of protein. That's right. Head to your nearest Walmart today, Sam's Club, walk to the pharmacy section at both, grab yourself a box of Built Bars. You can pick up a four-bar box of cookies and cream at Walmart, Sam's Club. You can pick up a 13-bar box with our hit flavors, brownie batter, and churro. You can thank me later on all of those. All right, we're back in this episode of the Locked on Penguins podcast. I'm your host, Hunter Hodes. That is, of course, Josh Yoey to my right. Um, Josh, who are you looking forward to seeing improve um, in the second half of the season? Or, you know, just, you know, what units I, I also could say, you know, who or what are you looking for big improvements from in the second half of the season as the Penguins try to extend the league's longest playoff streak and try to cement themselves as a contender again? Well, there are a few keys. Number one, Tristan Jari needs to be healthy. Yeah. We, we know that. And, you know, the Penguins said he's out through the All-Star break. I think everybody assumes that means he'll be good to go February 7th against Colorado. I was going to ask if, you, if you've if you heard of anything about that injury. No, and I mean, he may be ready for that game, but I don't think the Penguins have come out and said that. People are kind of assuming he's good to go then. We will see. I, I know he hurt his groin at Fenway um, the day of the Winter Classic. I don't think this – particular injury is related to that one hopefully not because groins are not a good injury for goaltenders at all um he needs to stay healthy number one uh number two the chris letang we've seen the last few games he needs to uh stay at the party for a while uh he you know the, the guy that we saw in october and november and listen i love chris i you know i certainly respect him as a player a great deal he was no good in october and november he, he was hurting them more games than not he, he was just I, I don't know what was going on with him, but he, he was playing really at a very low level for his standard. They need Chris Letang to be healthy playing 27 minutes a night um, when he's healthy and playing at a high level like he has the last few games. That's a game changer for the Penguins. He's still that guy. Um, so if he can play at that level and if you can have Jari just staying healthy because I think Jari's really good. Um that's a big deal in and of itself. And the one other thing I have to mention, and, you know, you can blame whoever you want for this, but it starts at the top to me with, with Crosby and Malkin. Uh, the power play has been embarrassing. And it, the numbers are better than they sh they really are because the second power play has actually been decent. Yeah. Um, but that first power play for the Penguins – it has been painful to watch at times, and they need to figure it out. There's no net front presence at all. There's a refusal to shoot the puck. There is you know, constantly giving up shorthanded chances. It's embarrassing how many. And, it, and it's obvious to me, Hunter, that other teams play the Penguins differently on the power play. They're trying to score shorthanded goals because they know they're there to be had. Um, just the lack of awareness is – startling to me um they need to figure that out badly um goals are typically a little harder to come by when you, you go down the stretch and you need to take advantage of the power play and the penguins just refuse to do it and uh if those three things can happen right power play gets a little better Latang well, keeps playing like we've seen the last few games if jari can stay healthy i think the penguins make the playoffs regardless of if they make a move or not but those are all ifs right now because of what we've seen in the first half yeah, no, I think I agree with all three of those. And the power play, especially, Josh, for as good as Todd Reed, everyone says that Todd Reed is this great power play coach. And I'm not knocking his defensive work because I thought he did a great job with Mike Matheson, turning him around. Right. Um, you know, he's done a great job so far, I think, with uh, Ty Smith this season. But his power play unit, ever since he got here, I feel like, Josh, you know, they fired Mark Recchi after that power play wasn't good. Mm -hmm. Everyone said it was going to improve. Has it really? I don't really see too much improvement with it. They're still doing that. I know Jesse Marshall, your colleague from the athletic wrote that amazing article where he pointed out how that drop pass is just killing everything. And teams are just coming up being aggressive because they can like they, they do their homework on the penguins and right. they see that it's, it's a, it's just a bad play and they're not letting them into the zone. And that leads to shorthanded opportunities the other way. And, that's a, that's a main reason why they're getting killed out there. And, you know, Mike Sullivan only likes, it seems like putting out his top players for 50, 55 seconds, maybe a minute 
you know, unlike someone like Alex Ovechkin on the Capitals, who's out there for the full two minutes just because yeah. that's just who he is, I think. But um, it's startling, to say the least, that how a team with surefire Hall of Famers, really other good snipers on their top unit, can have a power play be this bad. You know, I thought it couldn't get worse after what happened with the 0 for 9 versus New Jersey. <laughs> um, it it got worse after that, to, to say the least. And, it gets, it gets yeah. worse every time you have to watch the five on three power play because that's oh, when they get yeah. really embarrassing, right? That that one just makes no sense to me. I, I don't. I've never seen a team work so. It, it feels like they're working so hard on the power play, but there's just so little coming in return from them. It's it's very weird. Um, and you know, Josh, that loss to the Sharks. You know, that, I think that woke up a lot of people because you know they were playing fine, kind of in that game, but you know they gave you know, way too many chances back to a team that played the night before to a team that is legitimately tanking this year. I mean, they, they have their plan and they're going for Connor Bedard. Oh, yeah. But, you know, as for the Penguins, Josh, you know, I'll get to this here. What happens if this, this team has another first round exit or doesn't make the playoffs? Would that be it for this front office here? Would Fenway want to bring their own front office in and just be like, yeah, we're done with this. We still want to win. Um, we're going to hire our own guys. Well, I, I will say this. Let's say the Penguins lose in the first round yeah. or if they don't make the playoffs at all. Um, in either scenario, um, that will not trigger a rebuild. The Penguins aren't rebuilding anytime soon. You, you just gave all these contracts this past summer. You're not just going to snap your fingers and say, all right, let's blow it up. That's not going to happen. Um, and I also think Mike Sullivan's job is safe no matter what. Uh, the fact is he has five years left on his contract. That's a lot. That's a I lot. was going to ask you about that, Josh. Like, some, I know people want him fired on Penguins Twitter and uh, subreddit and stuff, but I don't think there's any way he's getting canned no matter what happens this season, right, Josh? No, certainly not this season right. I, for a lot of reasons. I can tell you the FedMy group people really, really like him. Sidney Crosby really, really likes him. Um, and you know how it is. If you're going to fire a coach, okay, that's fine. Who are you going to get that's better, right? And I, I don't think there is anyone out there who's better right now. I, like I said, I don't agree with everything he's done. Yeah. I'm sure he's not above criticism, certainly not. And there seems to be some kind of issue in terms of the communication between the coaching staff and the team right now, and that ultimately is on him. But he's not in trouble. He's not going anywhere. Uh, Ron Hextall, however, I'll tell you what, if the Penguins flame out this season – I, I would be surprised if he's back next year. Uh, the Fenway group wants to win badly. And while I don't think it's fair to call Hextall's time in Pittsburgh a disaster, I will go back to this. He took the job two years ago. Yep. The Penguins told him at the time. David Morehouse told him, we want you to win us another cup, and we also want you to simultaneously replenish our farm system. Now, and I wrote in my article yesterday, it was a stupid request. You can't really do both. No. You really can't. You got to pick one or the other, okay? And they were greedy. And they wanted both. And it was a tough spot for Hextall and Burke to be in because it's almost impossible to pull off. But you know what? They accepted the challenge. And two years later, the Penguins' farm system still sucks. And the Penguins just as an NHL product, very much appear to be declining, look like nothing more than a fringe playoff team right now. So it's hard to be complimentary of the general manager in this spot, especially when you've got Jared McCann going to score 45 goals in Seattle this year, right? Stop. And there, there, there are other examples of mistakes. Oh. He's made. And all GMs make mistakes, but I think a lot of the roads go back to the expansion draft two years ago the asinine decision to protect Jeff Carter. And I'm not knocking Jeff. I'm just, I know for a fact, I know people in the Seattle organization, they were never going to take him. That, never. They didn't want a guy who was going to be 37 years old. That wasn't going to happen. Um, the fact that the Penguins didn't figure out a way to keep Jared McCann, how good would he look as your number three center right now? Or or you could have him on Geno's wing and have you know, Zucker on your third line. How, how good would that be? Um but instead, they made the decisions they made, and they're a lesser team for it. And I think, barring some kind of surprising cup run this season, I don't think Ron Hextall survives this. 
Yeah. Even even Josh, even if they win a round, say they play, I don't know, Carolina, Boston. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you play Boston, you're probably on a run, again. You're that's a runaway train to get bounced in five games, I would think. Though I will say the Penguins have played the Bruins tougher than some other teams have this yep. season, but that's never really been a good matchup for them. No. Even if they win a round, Josh, and then lose in the second, you still think that's probably not enough. Mm-hmm. Tough to say. It depends on the circumstances. If they went around, that could change everything, though, yeah. simply because they haven't won a series since 2018. It's been five years. Weird. Just just to get that taste in your mouth to win a series and to be one of the eight teams remaining in the playoffs, um, that, that might buy everybody some time if that were to happen. Um, but, you know, you can see the standings as well as I. And if they do get in, it's probably as a wild card. And if you're a wild card, that means you're getting probably Carolina or Boston. Uh, good luck. Uh, th- those are two of the best teams in hockey. That's, I think they're both nightmare matchups for the Penguins. And I, it's it's just hard to envision this team winning a series right now. Yeah, um, I think that's, you know, I will say I said the same thing last year. Then they blew the doors off the Rangers for the first four games and yep. Louis Domingue took it back. But you know, th- this just feels a bit different. I'll say that. I think it's a little unfair for me to fully go into that. I know they looked cooked at the end of last season, though they turned to the switch. Um, you know, I thought the p- thing people at the time were saying, Josh, that Mike Sullivan's message was going stale. Do you think that message is going stale right now? Or, I mean, I don't think it is, but, you know, sometimes, you know, just because coaches have – short shelf lives in the league as a whole, you know, that can trigger any kind of coaching change. Do you think like his messages are not going through? Because he said after the Sharks game, I believe you're the one that tweeted out. I think other media members, he has, he said, I have to do a better job of coaching this team. Mm. So I think, you know, is he self-aware that maybe it's just not getting through them? Yeah, it was interesting. I actually asked Sid after the game, I said, is there some, something lost in translation here between the coaching staff and you guys? And he knew exactly what I was asking him. And he, he said, no, absolutely not. He said, there's nothing wrong with this system. There's nothing wrong with this coach. He said, no, it was, Sid was kind of aggra- it was aggressive for Sid. Usually he just kind of rides the fence. He pretty passionately defended Mike Sullivan. I, hmm. I don't think Sullivan's above criticism. I, I don't. And if he didn't have those two Stanley Cup rings, would he be in trouble? Oh, yeah. No question. Because they look like a stale team. They, they look like a poorly coached team right now. They yeah. really do. History tells us they're not a poorly coached team, though. That That's the thing. Uh, this guy, in my opinion, Sullivan has been such of a good coach for so long in Pittsburgh. Uh, rarely have I blamed him for any of their playoff failures. I never felt like it was a coaching issue. And I, I have a lot of respect for the work that he puts in. And I think his staff is good. Um, ultimately... A couple of things. I don't think they have enough good players. I know that's rudimentary and to the point, but I, I don't think they do. And secondly, secondly, their best players, Crosby, Malk, and Latang, Gensel, these are great hockey players. Maybe not in Sid's case, but in the case of the others, they have a lot of bad habits. They always have. And they've always just had the talent to get away with some of the stuff that they do. And they're still great, but you can see the rest of the league just kind of catching up to them a little bit in terms of skill and talent. And the Penguins don't want to change how they play. Um, they still want to be like the young guns who could win 7-6 whenever they feel like it. I, I really believe that. I, I think it's just a part of their DNA, and I'm talking about the best players on the team. They want to play that style of hockey, and I just don't think they're as equipped to do it as they once were. And I, I don't blame the coach for that. I think they would – drive any coaching staff nuts. I It's funny, when Latang was out of the lineup the first time after his stroke, I asked Jeff Petrie what it was like being on the power play because they had a couple of good games with him on the power play. I said, yeah. man, I said, things look like they're going pretty nice. You're fitting in well. And he looks at me and says, you think, really? I said, <laughs> "I said, yeah, you look you look good to me. He said, I don't know, man. He said, they, they play their own game out there. I've never played with guys like this before on the power play. Like, it, they're different. I don't. I'm trying to figure it out. He wasn't really being critical of them, but he was just saying, like, these guys kind of do their own thing. Like, they're not really doing what the coaches tell yeah. them. <laughs> like, I'm just trying to do what the coaches tell me. But now there's something else going on on the ice. So it, it feels like, Josh, it's been the same thing with their three on three struggles as well. You know, people have, I think they, people have asked about their overtime struggles, and Mike Sullivan said the same thing about the power play. Well, 
you know, we try not to overcoach them, try to see them do their own thing. Well, their own thing has led them to probably the worst uh-huh. I've ever seen them since three on three started. You know, a mm. few more wins, Josh, they're up near third place, uh, right behind the right behind the Rangers or tied with the Rangers for third in the Metro. No, the three on three play a couple of things. Um, God, I always say a couple of things with every answer. This team's very multifaceted right now. A yeah. couple of things. Um, they look slow. I don't th- on three and three against certain teams, especially. They never used to look slow. They're just having a hard time keeping up. Malkin, especially, you can see that. But really, it's it's just the mental mistakes that we see three on three. Um, you know, I think there was one game Malkin swooped behind the net, and it gave a three on two, and they lost. And and Sullivan yeah, even, right. See- yeah, right. And Sullivan said after the game, like you can't go behind the net. And you can tell they tell Gino that all the time, and and he just can't help himself. He won't. He wants to do certain things that, that he likes. Um, you know, the bad line change in New Jersey when Pedersen jumped on early. You can't do that. Um, you know, Gino took the penalty the other night. Can't do that. Um, they're just finding different ways to lose three on three. And it's just a mental thing. And it might cost them a playoff spot, really. All the mental mistakes they make there, they're, they're going to cost themselves four or five points this season, really. And games they otherwise should have won. That, that can easily be the difference between being a playoff team and not. So things we used to take for granted with the Penguins, the three-on-three yeah. points, the shootout points, the uh, you know, loading up on the power play, um, those strengths have largely left them. And that's one of the reasons that I say they just look far more vulnerable right now than, than they have really any time since I started covering them in 2009 for sure. Um, they just look flawed and um, – I think they're in trouble. I'm not saying they're not going to make the playoffs. If you put a gun to my head and ask, please don't. But if you, but if you were to do that, I, I'd probably still pick them to get in. Um, I, I know how important that streak is to them. I know how important it is to Sidney Crosby to be in the playoffs. So I won't bet against him. And the Penguins actually have a really soft schedule in March and April. Um, that should help them down the stretch. But make no mistake, uh, they are in trouble. This isn't going to be some easy quest for them. Yeah. No, I agree with you, Josh. And, you know, gun to my head right now. Please don't anyone do that. I would yeah. pick them to make the playoffs um, as well. And, you know, we'll have to see how they do in the February portion of the schedule. But, Josh, I think that's um, all I have for you uh, today uh, for this episode of the Locked on Penguins podcast. Um, you know, All-Star Weekend's upon us. Andy Crosby will be there. Um, no other Penguin will be there, though. I think they're all on vacation. I saw um, – I said this a couple of times. I think Raquel's down in Florida with his family – Gino, I've heard, has gone skiing and then is going back down to Miami. So he's just doing everything this week. <laughs> like the other players are they're going on vacation and stuff. So I feel bad for Sid. He, he wanted to go on vacation, but he's got to go play in the All Star game. So it, yeah, well, at least we'll have his good buddy Nate there. They can just get drunk during one of the skills competitions and have fun together. Probably go to Gino's house afterwards in Miami. It's not far away. I mean, might as well, right? Yeah. No. Yeah. Exactly. Um. Again, Josh. You know, thank you so much for coming on. I. Really appreciate it, and you know, just I'll give you for in case anyone is not following you or your work, which would be crazy. Um, I'm sure there are some people out there. There's a few um, oddballs out there, Hunter. You never know. I know. I'll, I'll let you plug your work and everything here. Uh, yeah, just yeah, come to theathletic.com. I I'm not just gonna plug myself. It's a uh, it's a great site for for sports fans, and it's not just hockey. It's pretty much any sport you can think of. We cover so many sports. It's it's wild. It really is. Um, that's nah, a great website. So. I know a lot of people have signed up, but it's only a couple of dollars a month, so it's quite affordable these days. So I certainly invite everybody to uh, come on by and sign up. Yeah, do that. You can follow him on Twitter as well. So, again, thank you all so much for listening to this special episode of the Locked on Penguins podcast. I'll be back with another one for you all on Thursday. I'll talk to you all then.